And then now I introduce to you the team that's been working on minimizing variation in water usage. Thank you for joining us this morning. Um, we are the water team, and we are interested in reducing the water usage in the Howling Cow Dairy Facility using the Six Sigma techniques. And my name is Chloe Breen. So the company we are targeting is the Howling Cow Dairy Facility, which has been providing NC State with all of its dairy um, products for years, such as ice cream and milk. Um, as Howling Cow and other companies modernize their practices, they're more so interested in um, sustainable measures um, for various reasons um, and trying to um, move away from wasteful practices. And a lot of companies do this using control methods such as um, the Six Sigma Demig method to um, overall improve their quality as well as reduce their carbon footprint. So our overall objective was to reduce the water usage of the Howling Cow Dairy Facility. And we were planning to do this by applying the um, Six Sigma's Demaic process, which you'll see each stage is um, in that uh, diagram over there. And we are hoping that our suggestions could further contribute to the sustainability methods that are already employed at NC State. So why do we care about environmental sustainability? Well first, I feel that it's ethically right. I feel like we as individuals and as companies should care about preserving the water and our energy and our air so that these resources are available for future generations. Um, also a um, topic that we're all familiar with is money and um, having more envir environmentally sustainable practices could yield in um, money savings which would be beneficial of course to the facility because it would be lower production costs as well as those lower costs can be transferred on to their consumers so their the price to consumers can be either lower or be more constant, which would um, keep long, long time customers. And also, um, we made a survey in the beginning of the semester where we asked if people would prefer a environmentally sustainable company to another in their purchasing decisions. And we actually found out that 52% um, would actually prefer an environmental sustainable um, company to one that didn't. So we thought that that could be a, um, a tactic that Helen Cal could use um, as a marketing scheme. So we're talking to you about the define phase. Um, as the title suggests, this is the part of the project where we essentially identify uh, and define what problems, uh, you know, dealing with water usage that we could find. And we did this by focusing on identifying the critical areas of water usage within the plant. And then we also looked at the parties affected, like the internal and external customers. And then of course we prepared for data collection. Um, so one of the first things we did was create a fishbone diagram detailing how low water is used. Um, and so as you can see, we have the floor sprayers, we have sanitation like CIP, and then uh, case washer, and then of course, uh, pipes that might leak and wasted water. Um, what we have here are pictures of the uh, case machine. And as you can see on the left side, or the, yeah, the left side, uh, you have the water coming in, and then uh, you have hot and cold water. And then uh, right here is the pump that pumps the water from the reservoir into the case washing machine. And of course, this is the reservoir itself. This is where fresh water comes in. And it's usually filled to the top, close to the top. 
And then uh, over here is where the cases come in, the dirty cases come in. And then in, the, in this picture right here are the pipes coming across and it might be hard to tell, I don't know if you can see, but there's nozzles here and that's where the water comes out to spray the uh, cases. And then of course you have the cases coming out and then a drain pipe here. And when we were looking at the case machine, these are these two areas were some of the biggest areas as far as uh, uh, leaking water and wasted water coming out. Uh, we saw that as the uh, conveyor moves moves the cases out, the chain that was under the conveyor on the, under the conveyor belt, there was a lot of water leaking from there. I guess from the you know the rinsing cycle, and it's just coming out and it's leaking all all over the floor. And then of course this is this is one of the main drain pipes. And a lot of times, this is connected to that reservoir that I showed you before. And uh, a lot of times, um, I've heard that, I haven't seen it myself, but uh, some of the other group members have. They, there's a cap that would go here, and a lot of times it would fall off, and that would cause the, the reservoir to leak, and of course, a lot of water loss. And then of course, there's also, you can probably tell here, there's a lot of leakage under the reservoir as well. So that's one of the reasons why I was decided to focus on the case machine. And then of course, this is a video of how the case machine runs. So some of you worked on there, so you know how this works, but for those of you who don't, this is just kind of the whole process in action. So basically, you see uh, the cases are coming through, the, the reservoir is filling up, uh, and then you've got the water leaking out of the various spots here. It also leaks out of, uh, there's two holes down here and other drains as well. Um, that's the cap that we were talking about that actually comes off, so they have to end up refilling the reservoir uh, whenever that happens. Yeah, so as you can see, you've got the two drains there, and there's just water coming out the bottom every which way, pretty much, so it's not really being, uh, Reused or optimally utilized uh, in that case, and then uh, as the cases go through, they get uh, moved on to be used for packaging and such. All right. So uh, once we defined our problem, we had to figure out how to measure uh, the data that we we're going to use for analysis. Uh, so with the help of our uh, our very helpful technicians down in the plant, we had them install a, a water meter gauge so that we could see how much water was running through. Uh, per unit time for the process. So we would go down uh, on two different days and check the water meter at certain time intervals to see how much was being used. Um, and then we would record that water uh, data for the future analysis. So that's just a picture of the, uh, the meter that was installed. So we clicked it on, like I said, two different days uh, between 6.45 and 1.30. Um, within 15 minute time intervals for most of the time, we also recorded 30 and uh, 45 minute time intervals depending on uh, what schedules were allowed there. And we also had to validate the flow rate of it. So the water meter was installed, so it gave you just a, um, a numeric value for how much water was going through. We actually went down and we got the, a volume of water and saw how much it was telling us was coming out, and we validated that to make sure it was the correct amount coming out by weighing it and calculating uh, the actual volume. And it was it was very very close. So we, we um, considered what might happen uh, if it wasn't, but given the data, it's not very significant that uh, that goes through. So we were able to calculate based on uh, how many gallons were used for the entire shifts. And um, that being said, there, the two shifts were run uh, for different amounts of time. Uh, the first one was much shorter uh, than the second. There was uh, a, a lot less cases washed. Um, but uh, through that data, we were able to calculate the average flow rate as well as the gallons uh, that were used per case. So this is just a, a two chart showing uh, the types of uh, or the, what cases were washed for each product that was being uh, put out. And so you can see on the, the second day there was a great number more cases being washed than the first one. Uh, so basically this is just all of our data that we used for our next stage uh, analysis. And then uh, once we had our data, we had to decide how we were going to analyze the data. Um, we decided to use uh, these tools, so IMR charts, histograms. Um, so the way we decided to do it was after we had recorded uh, the, the water usage per time interval, um, 
in order to make the data in such that we could use it to make things like IMR charts, what we did was we took each, the gallon measurement at each time interval, sometimes 15, sometimes 30 minutes, and uh, just took the difference between each time interval. So we had a, we had a flow rate. So we had the flow rate per every time interval. Um, and then the first thing we did was make an IMR chart. And an IMR chart is an individual chart and a moving range chart. And if you go to the, I think it's. Okay. Okay. Well, okay. The first thing we did was make the IMR charts, but the next slide is histogram. So we'll do that first. So, so the histogram on the left is just showing that's over both days. So it's using uh, both production days. And it just shows the, uh, the flow rate for time interval. So it's just, you see most of the time the flow rate is around between 13 and 19 for the most part, uh, but there was a lot of variation. Um, and then on the right. Yeah, we also did uh, t-testing, so just basic, basic t-testing hypothesis testing, um, and taking that those average flow rates per time interval, um, and then calculating p-value to see whether the data was significantly different. Um, so after I calculated that p-value, um, it was a very, very small number, which means that there is significant difference uh, between the two days, so we can uh, we can say that it is likely that there's the variation is not just random chance there. So, and then so these are for the IMR charts. So the I chart on the left is just showing the raw. That's just the flow rate per time interval. Um, so it just shows you the actual <coughs> value, and then the, uh, the lines are the upper and lower control limits, and then the average. And then the chart on the right is the moving range, and that shows you the difference between each time interval. So that's why the second chart starts on the second time interval because to get a difference, you have to have two intervals. Um, and then this is the same chart for the second day. Uh, the second day, of course, has, has, was longer, so we had more sampling data. So that's why there's more samples. So for the improved phase, we have some suggestions for the CAP system. We didn't uh, analyze any data for the CAP system, but it's a part of the process that uses a lot of water. So uh, the first suggestion is to check the conditions of the CAP system to validate the system and check for uh, some new technologies that can be used to reduce the water or new chemicals. Uh, start the water from the last rinsing cycle in the CIP system that can be used for the next day for cycle. That is, the last cycle is the cleanest water for the CIP system, so it can be used for the next day for cycle. Uh, validate the control flow meters in the CIP circuits. So uh, you can make sure that you're using the right amount of water, you're not using too much water for the CAP system. And uh, add or update the spray nozzles and racing heads to uh, new ones with more pressure that can use less water and can clean better. Uh, so for uh, the case machine, uh, we noticed that during the process, uh, a lot of crates was inside the, case, uh, the washing machine and they stayed there being rewashed many times. So we suggest to um, install an automated conveyor system that can be uh, put after the washing case machine. It would be a, a spiral system that can uh, start all the crates in a, a safe and clean uh, environment, uh, update and modify the spray nozzles at the uh, wash case machine, and rinse all case simultaneously, simultaneously to uh, store them in the conveyor system. In a perfect world, if you had more money in any, or any amount that you needed to spend on it, it'd be great to buy a new case machine, but we know that's not always an option. Um, so we thought that automating it uh, might be a little less expensive. Because um, we saw a lot of the issue was that, um, not that it was human error, but a lot of times people had to change, manually change the, the flow rates in the case machine to make sure that reservoir was filled or to, um, to get it down. So we figured that uh, automating it would just make that process a lot easier. You could optimize how much water was actually being used per cycle and per shift. Um, so for our control phase, um, now that you've heard our recommendations for stuff, um, we figured that the, the Six Sigma techniques can be used afterwards uh, to help validate that process, uh, both for the t-testing like we had done, and the ANOVA testing if you want to look at uh, various spots where the water's uh, leaking out or you want to make sure that, um, that it's being validated across um, all parts of the machine and not just one specific part where it's leaking. Um, and therefore you can assure the standardization of the process and so they run more efficiently and help save money. Um, and you can limit your amount of variation, which is kind of the whole purpose of the Six Sigma. Um, and once you have uh, your process for standardization, uh, we think it's important to have a error detection system or plan um, so that if something does go wrong, say your process goes out of those control limits, those specification limits, 
that it's easy for you to go in and modify it so that you start running uh, under those optimal conditions again. So, we'd like to thank uh, Dr. Stevenson and uh, Chris, as well as everyone else listed that they thanked as well. Um, Carl, Gary, uh, Jack, Roy, and all of the Howling Cow technicians and other employees that helped us uh, get our data and give us uh, ideas on how to go about our project and point us in the right direction. I have a question. In the uh, when we were looking at the video, yeah, uh, we see we, you know water coming out of lots of parts of the case machine and going onto the floor. And you you specifically pointed out the rinse side. Uh, now. Do you know, is it possible to reuse rinse water? If, assuming that the uh, the cases were washed properly, then you should be able to reuse the rinse water. Because, I mean, ideally the rinse water would just be water and then soap. Mm. And there, so there wouldn't be any contaminants. Um, but of course that would depend on how effectively the case machine is washing the crates. And we don't know that. And also the levels at which you have to have that, what, what clean, uh, cleanliness level you have to um, right. be running at. And, and I'll speak to that a little bit. The, the rinse water has to be clean and, and debris and pathogen free. So uh, that system is so old, it was designed just a one time pass. Right. And you could probably filter it and then maybe put it through a an ozonator or maybe UV uh, sterilization, deal with that, but the soap carryover would be a problematic thing and keep concentrating. But it, that could be make up water that could be put right back into the wash. Yeah. Right. Make up. And so you'd be at least capturing it twice in, at a minimum. Yeah. Uh, so that, that could be done. Even with a new system, if it's using one time rinse water, that could be possibility yeah. to use wash makeup. Yeah, similar to the, with the suggestion with the CIP system where you use the mostly clean rinse water from the final cycle of CIP as the first wash cycle for the next day or shift. So you propose to do an ANOVA test? Well, possibly. We use mainly um, the T test for this because we were just looking at the, the one data for the two sets. We're saying a no testing ice would be possible um, just for standardization practices after um, other measures are put in. I guess because you can use a no testing, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but for um, for various areas, comparing where like uh, which areas having the uh, the most variation in the case machine itself. Yeah. You, so. um, okay. So you would use it to um, prove uh, a hypothesis. Have you talked about hypothesis testing? Yeah. Yeah. So what would your hypothesis be? Well, you could say that, um, say, say this area of the case machine, we, we say that um, we're trying to figure out whether this is way, or leaking more water and not cleaning as efficiently as this other part of the case machine. Um, and so being able to say, okay, well, we have the, the data from this, it's, it's leaking this much or it's cleaning this much, it's, um, and then seeing if there's variation between those two groups as opposed to just one area. So what would your hypothesis be? We could have a hypothesis about whether or not um, the difference in different days is due to, like, for instance, we had the two days where there was two different um, production, two different, yeah, two different production cycles, I guess. So we could see if the if, if the difference is due to the type of milk you're packaging, or if the difference is due to something else, like the um, who, yeah, who it is that's running the machine at the time. Uh, so if we had a more robust way of measuring, we could go down and we could measure, we'd have to take the data from, we'd measure the flow rate, count the amount of cases going through during a 15 minute time interval, um, record who it is that's operating the machine, record what type of product is being made at the time, and then ideally we could also record, because like, there's all the different points where the water's leaking out, if we had vessels or containers where we could measure how much water is leaking out of each spot, mm -hmm. For a certain time interval, we could then compare, like, figure out which exact factor is causing the most variation. Um, the only reason we didn't, we wanted to do that, where we we measure each point of leak, but we didn't really know how do we do that easily because we'd have to fill up a container, and then if it fills up, we'd have to.
measure it, dump it out, and refill it again. And then it, I don't know how we would have done that while still have the case machine operating normally, just because that's a lot of. Well, a lot of the spots where it was leaking out, it was not easy to get a large enough container in there to get a substantial yeah. amount of water that would have given us accurate data to do that. But yeah, the theoretically, there's all, those are all different ways that you can use the unknown testing to, uh, to figure out which factors are affecting it more or less. Helen, do you have any questions? Dr. Joyner, do you have any questions for us? I do, yeah. Sorry, I have myself on mute while you guys are doing anything, so if there's any noise here, you guys aren't distracted by it. <laughs> okay. uh, I have a couple of questions. My first question is that you mentioned that your flow meter was close to the actual amount of water that was coming out. How close was it, and did you feel the need to correct for any differences from what the flow meter was measuring versus what was actually the real flow rate? We got what was it? It was it was a tenth of a. It was a tenth of a pound difference off of a was it thirteen pounds of water used? Yeah. Something. Yeah. So. Yeah, we we talked to you about that. When we, it was a tenth of a pound. It was it was a very um, minuscule amount. Of so. I guess whatever a tenth of a pound out of thirteen pounds is, so it'd be what somewhere less than ten percent, but it'd be. Can't do the math in my head. <laughs> right. so that's one of those things that it doesn't sound very big when you're working with those small amounts, but when you get to right, several get thousand to. gallons of water, that does end up being pretty significant. And um, I know that companies are chasing down those tenths of percents to yeah. improve. Um, so that may be um, significant if you're working with millions of pounds of water a day. Right. Definitely. Um, I, I mean, we didn't we didn't look into it more because I mean. Just based off of the way that the flow meter is designed, that variance could be just due to our like having trouble reading the because the uh, the meter is where you have the scrolling number at the top, but then that needle around the outside, and so it's really hard to get an exact decimal point. So I mean that could have been due to just the fact that the meter is limited to single pounds. It doesn't do or single gallons. It doesn't do tenth of gallons. It's also mm -hmm. possible that some of the water that's coming out isn't actually going into the bin because it's leaking out of various spots yeah. as well. Yeah. So there, yeah, we actually had to fiddle with the uh, valves to make sure that we were getting all the water into the bucket. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I know those systems are tricky to set up, yeah. and if you have leaks anywhere, it, it throws something off. Yeah. Um, my second question is, is that if you could go back to any point in this project and do something differently, measure something, define something differently, um, take a different approach to anything, what would that be? I know exactly what I would change is that when we took the measurements, when we went down there on different shifts and took the measurements of the water, um, I think we definitely should have been counting the cases as we measured the water so that we could get an accurate number of the yeah, like the flow rate per case would have been a much better, I think, statistic to be measuring. Because so that's that's what I would change. With we're, the kind of the yeah, we're able to estimate how many cases it's washing per unit uh, time interval. But the problem is that because, like they said, that um, when the cases run through, they don't run through at a, a set rate. They stop sometimes. So the same case may be in there for five or ten minutes, just being yep. washed over and over again, as opposed to them running through. And that's kind of one of the reasons why we thought the automation system was going to be very useful. Yeah. I, that was personally my my favorite area of improvement to look at was um, trying to prevent the cases from stagnating inside the case washer, which was the whole point of that uh, conveyor accumulator to create so that you could wash more cases at once. And then if you had a large enough buffer of, of clean cases, you could potentially shut off the case machine for a while uh, before you had to start back up again. Because I mean, as you saw in the video, at the very beginning of the video we showed, I don't know if you noticed, but the line wasn't moving at that point, but that's dependent on the machine that actually packages the milk. And then I have a I have a, a question for someone besides Nick or McKendry. <laughs> Again, <laughs> um, and it's the same question that I asked the previous group, which was, you know, in considering we started out the semester talking about quality management, building a culture of quality. We talked about cost of quality, and um, then we went in and I taught you all these tools. Um, how, how would you go about, um, if, if you were in Randy's shoes and you really wanted to make a, a difference here, um, 
how would you as shift supervisor um, go about doing that? Give the employees a special training so they don't uh, change these flows that they were doing so they know what they were doing for the keys machine. Cool. How would you, so you're asking basically how would you go about uh, teaching or uh, the employees about how to improve the quality? <laughs> uh, basically, like the previous group, I mean, one of the things you could do is, you know, teach them the Six Sigma, of course it's very valuable, and then learning the, the main technique, you know, define, measure, analyze, group control. Um, and then just, I guess, find a way to incentivize you know, getting your employees to want to to try to learn that process and, and improve everything that uh, goes on in the plant. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I guess I would say just be very um, knowledgeable about the case machine. Be very knowledgeable about um, how messing with the gauge affects water level and um, really stressing that on to your workers and um, just teaching them methodology. I was also gonna say, it's kind of important to teach them to have them understand control limits and where the process is supposed to be operating because you can change the valve, but if you don't know what it's supposed to be running at and what the overall goal is, that's kind of an issue there. And on top of that, I also think that it's, um, at least for, I don't know about everybody, but for me, I think sustainability is kind of a big issue, especially now considering how much of uh, a problem water in in the world is becoming as, as a resource and so if you can convince people that what you're doing is important you're running it at these control limits or within that um, is making a difference and I feel like they're going to be more inclined to do a better job or put more effort into their work so mm -hmm. one more question okay, sorry. Um, so I have a question about your serving yeah that's what I think um, so <laughs> the, okay. all right so who, oh, my questions are who did you ask and um, did you do any kind of literature search that would, did you look into this anymore? Because to me, those numbers were surprising, but I, I want your take on it. Yeah, so I actually made that um, survey on SurveyMonkey, which yeah. is, um, I'm sure you know, it's the website. And I actually just posted the link on the Wolfpack students' Facebook. So I guess I was just targeting um, NC State students. Yeah, I, I mean, I was hoping that, you know, whoever was on that Facebook was NC State students. And, and the data that's on there, the 52.7%, um, huh. that was kind of lower numbers. That was just asking, which, are you, which prefer a company doing that? Yeah. But as far as asking people, we had some more basic questions on, like, how important is sustainability to you, and breaking it from, you know, like a one to five, or saying, um, how important is is it for you that NC State's sustainability is improved? And it was way more like 80% of people seemed generally concerned that NC State was more focused on sustainability. Right. Like right. a couple hundred people that responded to the survey or whatever. So. I guess my, my surprise lies in that I would think if 80% if of people are concerned about sustainability, it seems like that number would be higher. And if all of these companies are putting all this energy into marketing green practices, it seems like those numbers their market research might show higher numbers that people in the U.S. would would maybe yeah, and, make and, and like we said, it's primarily students, and so a lot of them may be uh, not not say ignorant, but not as aware of sustainability factors and how much that factors in um, just to everything they do and uh, yeah. where we're heading in the next decade or two. So, right. Um, I think if you were to ask people who were uh, in the industry or knew more about it, I think we'd have higher numbers as far as people saying I would support a business that was uh, more focused on sustainability. So. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Yes,